Hello Booktube. Thanks very much for dropping by to check out this latest book review video. The photographic theme today is floral. Now, if I were choosing the best flower to go with the book that we're going to talk about today, I should have chosen a red camellia rather than a poppy, which I won't explain. I did say in my introductory video, spoilers don't bother me, but that doesn't mean I want to give away a lot of them. Uh, so, sadly, I don't have any camellia photos, so we are making do today with a red poppy. And the book we are reviewing is Masks by Fumiko Enchi, first published in Japanese in 1958. It was translated into English in 2008 by Juliet Winters Carpenter, and the edition that I am reading is the 2019 Penguin Vintage imprint. And of course, all the citation details are there below for you if you want to pick up the same copy. The cover art's quite simple and striking. I very much like those colours and I think they I think they work for the novel on a number of fronts. I'm sure that's the, the red, the camellia red, that is so uh, thematically important to the book. Right, when reviewing fiction, I'm here's my set questions. Uh, can I pitch this novel in two to three sentences? Masks is a work by one of Japan's most highly acclaimed and award-winning writers. The plot and the characters reflect uh, her understanding of the long tradition of supernatural stories and folklore in her country, which the author has transmuted into a contemporary setting. And that, that tension between the old and the new uh, creates a sense of uncanniness and suspense that drives the whole novel. How many pages long is it? That's very important, isn't it? This book is 123 pages of text, and that's very good. If you have just finished a very long work of any kind and you need to reward yourself with something that is still substantial in terms of literarily, but not, not demanding in terms of number of pages, this is a very, very good choice. Now, where did I obtain this book and how much did I pay? Well, there's a story here. This book was a very important purchase because in the UK uh, we had several months of COVID-19 lockdown restrictions which affected shopping, in particular book shopping. Uh, I discovered Enchi's novel the first time I was able to step inside a bookstore and browse after all those lockdowns. Um, I was in the Waterstones, located on Castle Street in Norwich, and I paid £8.99 for this paperback, which was full price. Now, I could have saved £3 if I'd have bought the Kindle version instead, but you, you've got to understand it had been almost two years since I'd seen the interior of a bookshop, so there was no way I was going to come out empty-handed. Um, I bought it because I was in a particular mood. Um, I won't talk about that now because it would make a long digression. I'm going to save the topic of moods for a separate book-related topic video. And a lovely spread of blossom to introduce the next question, which is, can you give a short biography of the author? Fumiko Enshi was born in 1905. She was the daughter of a prominent Tokyo professor of Japanese linguistics. She wasn't well enough to attend school regularly, so she was homeschooled by her paternal grandmother, who was fastidious about making uh, Fumiko familiar with the milestone works of Japanese literature and also introducing her to kabuki and no theatre. And her enthusiasm for theatre was reflected when she reached her 20s. She decided to become a writer and write for the stage. She didn't achieve a great deal of fame uh, with her stage works. It wasn't until after the Second World War when she took a decision to change tactic and write prose. That was when she achieved uh, the great acclaim that she's known for now. Uh, now, what has been translated into English is only three of her many novels, three that were published between 1957 and 1965, of which Masks is one. Uh, she died in 1986. Now, next question is to describe the setting. Now, I think this is important, the setting for this novel. It is 1950s Japan. In fact, it's so ordinary. The first two paragraphs of the book, you, there's n you don't think there's anything unusual that's going to happen particularly. You're, you, you begin in a coffee shop on the second floor of Kyoto Railway Station. You're in one of those booths with a narrow 
imitation wood tabletop. There's a vase holding just a single chrysanthemum. And there's, it's the 1950s, so there's an ashtray full of cigarette butts. It, it just couldn't be more ordinary. And you have, you're introduced to two professional men, a doctor and a university professor, and they've been friends since college, and they live in different cities, but they just happen to run into each other here in Kyoto, or so it seems. Describe the narrative viewpoint and the narrative voice. That's the next question. Now, this novel is taking a third-person, omniscient viewpoint. It gives the greatest amount of attention to the inner lives of two characters, Tsuneo Ibuki and Yasuko Togano. You could call them the couple in this novel. I should use air quotes, couple, because uh, they're not the typical romantic fiction couple. They are unusual. I, I want to make a comparison between Heathcliff and Catherine Earnshaw, but I, what I don't want you to do, that would be misleading, because Enchi's lovers, they don't have the same kind of disruptive personalities that Emily Bronte created for those two characters. Um, but if you were attracted to that, that uncanny, ugh, slightly unhealthy atmosphere of Wuthering Heights, and the idea that characters can affect each other even when they're not together, that's the kind of similar uncanniness that you're going to encounter in Masks. Fumiko has a narrative voice that is it's very calm, it's very matter-of-fact. I heard it in my head as softly spoken and female, and it had this complete assurance and authority. Imagine a, a priestess or an oracle. Those were the identities that suggested themselves to me as I was reading. Um, I'm going to quote a passage from page 33, just to give you a flavour of this novel. Yasuko looked around and gave an exclamation of surprise, as if only then becoming aware of the presence of another person. Her reaction was suspect, in view of the direction from which she must have come, but to both men her surprise appeared real. This isn't a guest. This is a distant relative of mother's. She looked at the beautiful woman as one might look at a small child. The woman's expression did not alter under Yasuko's gaze, but as she became aware of Ibuki and Mikame standing there, she blinked slowly, moving her lashes like a dark butterfly beating its wings in time with its respirations. In the same slow way, her face, white as marshmallow, broke into something like a smile, the interior of her mouth was dark and strangely alluring. After a moment, she got up, turned her back on them, and walked slowly down the far side of the hill. Ibuki had soon forgotten about her, but now, on the train, Yasuko's mention of the Firefly Party brought the woman's extraordinary face back to him. A persistent feeling nagged him that the face resembled something else, though what he could not say. Then he realized that her face might be perfectly inlaid on the Zono Ono mask they had seen the day before. He blinked, like one awakening from a dream. Next question. Is there anything readers should bear in mind when deciding whether to read this novel? I think it's important, if you want to get the best from this book, to appreciate it as a product of non-Western culture. And I'm not speaking as an expert. I went into this book knowing virtually nothing. And, and OK, that wasn't a problem. But doing a little bit of research really gave me so much more. Uh, for example, let's take gender roles. Gender roles, gender relationships and sexual norms were different in Japan from what would have been considered normal in 1950s Britain or North America. And the focus of Fumiko's novel is on the performative nature of gender particularly the, uh, the performance of women. Uh, it was criticising the extreme passivity that was considered ideal in women, but it required them to conceal a great deal of personal pain. If you know nothing about Japanese no masks or no theatre, I would recommend some research. Nothing heavy. Uh, I'm going to give you a link right here. Uh, it's a 17-minute video that tells the history of no performances and explains the meaning of some of the masks the reason why they are worn and why they look the way they do, which I admit it made me uneasy. 
Okay, new picture. A little bit, uh, I guess it depends what you feel like about insects. I chose this because I thought, okay, this is the, 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 the pointy bit, the tetchy bit. Uh, this is where I have to talk about, uh, is there problematic content in this book? Yes, there is. I mentioned that in my previous video, uh, if you haven't seen it already. Uh, I won't give details here of exactly what happens in the novel, but I will say if at present you find it difficult to read fictional mistreatment of someone with a mental or physical disability, then please be warned, you may not be able to finish this novel. Now, I should comment further, you know, what, what's the context? What's the, the purpose of that problematic content? I think um, the uncanny otherworldly atmosphere that Enchi is achieving in this novel by, by harking back to the past and to the present, um, by also creating a sense that something supernatural might be going on or not. Uh, by doing that, I think she's almost creating something like a no play written as a novel. Um, her characters, yes, they appear in one aspect to be ordinary 20th century Japanese citizens, but they are to one degree or another hiding their true selves. So they are, they are wearing masks. Um, I had the strange sense that I was watching almost a modern adaptation of a myth or an ancient legend. And this was particularly true regarding a very important character, Mieko Togano, uh, an older widow who was treated cruelly by her husband and his family who seeks revenge. Now the revenge is monstrous. It is the problematic content I referred to earlier. Um, but the events, there's, there's also a certain unrealism to them, if that makes sense. There's a question mark over whether it would have required supernatural ability to achieve all the things that Mieko plans for her revenge. And this exaggerated situation for me uh, it made the act of revenge itself less of a reality and more of a fable, more of a concept. To me, Enchi is using the novel as a place to try and reconcile pre- and post-war Japan, to warn that the traditional expectations of women, that they should never speak or act for themselves, that this was a dangerous cultural remnant that would cause women to harm themselves and to harm others. Um, one of the most useful articles I found on JSTOR, if you have access to JSTOR, um, look up an article by Wayne Pounds, uh, which appeared in the Journal of the Association of Teachers of Japanese. The title of the article is Enchi Fumiko and the Hidden Energy of the Supernatural. Pound compares Fumiko's writing to Henry James in The Turn of the Screw. And if you've ever read uh, that short piece of fiction, you will you remember that you're never quite sure in Henry James' story whether something supernatural is going on or somebody's psychological state of mind is so disturbed that they no longer have a connection with reality or they're losing their grip on reality. And both writers, they leave you in that unsettled place. Fumiko does that as well. Just like Ibuki, you can finish Fumiko's book feeling as though you've just woken up from a very weird dream. You don't know whether something really happened or, or didn't. Um, and I should add to a word about twins. The character who suffers mistreatment in this book is a twin. She's the girl in a pair of opposite sex twins. Um, there is a hint in the novel that Japanese culture has had different attitudes to twins than we are accustomed to, particularly opposite sex twins. Uh, twins were regarded as punishment, traditionally, for some transgression on the mother's part usually adultery. Uh, and as it happens, I, I think Fumiko may have chosen to create twin characters uh, to, to make visible the punishment of Mieko Togano, the punishment that she receives from her husband and her husband's family. And, and it's that punishment that she then uses her powers, if she has powers, to fight against. Right, last question. Do I have any suggestions for related or follow-up reading? The Tale of Genji, it's a classic work of Japanese literature, written in the 11th century by Lady Murasaki Shikibu. Now, Enchi would have known it well, and I imagined that if I also knew it well, I might have gained additional insights uh, from her novel. I have added this book to my Amazon wish list, one of my many 
Amazon wish list. Now, see, that would be a good booktube newbie question. How many book wish lists do you have? And that's another book review wrapped up. I've got plans for some short form content coming up very soon, as well as more reviews. I am currently 37% of the way through a Kindle version of France Fanon's groundbreaking work, White Skin, Black Masks. And I'm trying to decide also which of three novels is going to inherit my favorite bookmark. Now you can see this is my favorite bookmark. Um, it was a stocking filler one Christmas, and uh, it always goes in the book that I, uh, it always goes in a work of uh, that I'm very excited to read, you know, that I've been looking forward to for some time. So I have to choose now. Where does it go? Where does it go? Um, if you'd have enjoyed this video, please click the like button. That'd be great. Of course, I'd, I'd love that little compliment to me. Um, click subscribe if you want to see more of this content, because I will be back soon and I will look forward to meeting with you then. Bye bye.